First of all, welcome to all of you on this beautiful summer afternoon at the Rubin Center. I know parking was not a problem. I know some of you parked in Bow, probably. Um, anyway, welcome to the center. I don't know if you've been here before, but if you haven't come before, I hope you come back. Um, just a couple of very brief things. The center is designed to do two things. Train the next generation of leaders and inspire them to public service and to engage the state of New Hampshire in events like this. The cost of these events for the people who come is free. There's no charge for this, and that will never change. But those of you who might like to help the Rubin Center, no obligation, uh, there's a little membership brochure outside. Membership fees are very modest, uh, and it's helpful. It's not required, but it will help us build this program. I just want to make some very brief announcements. Uh, tonight's event with Senator Snow and Secretary Glickman is a very big deal. And their two voices are highly respected across this country, and you'll see that for yourself. And they've been great friends to this center. And Senator Snow is on our board of advisors, and she came to our first meeting today, and she's been a great friend to us. In February, on the 18th of February, those of you who have your pocket calendars out, uh, or go to the computer later, on February 18th in, in, uh, in the center, we'll be having the first David Broder Award and Lecture. David Broder died in uh, November of 2012. Uh, he was maybe the foremost political reporter in America. Two of his sons will be here uh, E.J. Dion will be here to talk about him, uh, and Dan Balls of the Washington Post will be receiving the award that night. Again, those events are free and open to the public. Uh, uh, at the end of March, uh, General Stanley McChrystal, who you may remember from Afghanistan, is now promoting national service, and he's not talking about military service, although obviously he favors that. He's talking about public service uh, for young people. AmeriCorps, Teach for America, or Teach for America, City Year. Uh, he's a very impressive person, and he said he was honored to come to the Rubman Center, so he will be here. Again, if you want to come, you just need to reserve a seat. And lastly, in April, uh, Senator Evan Bayh and Senator Judd Gregg will be here to talk about debt and deficit in the United States. It's a huge issue, and we're sponsoring, co-sponsoring that uh, with the Conquer Coalition. They've been a great partner here. And Senator Rudman was chairman of the Conquer Coalition for many, many years. So we are trying to bring high-quality programming here, offering it to you. The ultimate goal, obviously, is to have civic engagement and to help our students. I spend half of my life raising money. Don't worry, I'm not asking now. Uh, but that's what I'm doing. And I believe deeply in this center. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Mark Huddleston, who's the president of the university. Uh, he's been a great friend of the Rudman Center and obviously to the law school. Without his leadership, we would not be the University of New Hampshire School of Law. Uh, and with that, President Huddleston. Thank you, John. Uh, let me add just a very brief welcome of my own. Secretary Glickman warned me he has to leave to catch a flight at 5.30, even mid-sentence. He's going to walk out of here at 5.30, so we'll, we'll keep this very short. Um, you know, we're blessed to live in a part of the country that has many great institutions of higher education, but there really are very few of them. I, I, I would say one, but I have friends here from Maine, so I can't say just one, but we, we certainly have very few of them that have at their core, at, their, at, at the heart of their mission, public service, and the University of New Hampshire is one of them. And this law school uh, has at the heart of its mission, now that they're part of the UNH family, clearly public service in this institute, the Rudman Center, uh, clearly also has public service at its core, and I'm, I'm very, very proud of that. Uh, as John indicated, you could spend almost every afternoon here um, hearing a, a, a really stimulating uh, set of, uh, of speakers talk about uh, the issues of the day, and I would encourage you to do that. And it, it's free in one sense, as John said, but nothing is ever really free, and uh, he's very good at uh, soliciting contributions from individuals. I know there actually there are members of the New Hampshire General Court here, and I would point out that another way that you can support um, uh, the engagement mission 
of the University of New Hampshire and its sister institutions is actually by supporting public higher education in the state of New Hampshire. It's a, a, an odd concept, I know, but I would encourage everyone to think about that. Um, and uh, it really is, is a worthwhile goal. But welcome to all of you, and, uh, and thank you so much for being here, uh, Secretary Glickman and Senator Snow. Uh, this year, we admitted the first two Rodman Fellows here, two women, one from Wyndham, New Hampshire, one to Cornell, the other from New York, she went to SUNY Buffalo, and that means they get a free ride here. Uh, and they are highly qualified students who have a keen interest in public service, and so we want to make it possible for them with the cost of higher education. So I'm going to ask Amy Nesheim and Stephanie Ramirez to come up briefly to introduce our speakers and Professor Gravy. Good evening. We are delighted to welcome Senator Olympia Snow to New Hampshire, her adopted neighboring state. Senator Snow has recently given up her seat on the U.S. Senate, but that by no means indicates that she has given up her fight for the people of Maine and the rest of the United States. She has taken the qualities she possesses that gained her success and admiration in the Senate to the Bipartisan Policy Center in Washington, where she co-chairs its Commission on Political Reform. We are so happy to have her here to share the work she is doing and to fix the stalemate in Congress. <laughs> Joining Senator Snow is Secretary Dan Glickman. Secretary Glickman served as the Secretary of Agriculture under the Clinton administration. Secretary Glickman also represented the great state of Kansas as a congressman for 18 years. He is currently a senior fellow at the Bipartisan Policy Center, where he too works on policies that are designed to break the gridlock in Washington. We feel so honored to have them both with us tonight. Moderating tonight's event is our own Professor John Graby. Professor Graby has been a tenured professor at the law school for over five years. He is a highly respected and sought after expert on constitutional law. Please welcome our panelists. Good evening, everybody, and, uh, and welcome to the Rudman Center. We're so pleased to have you all here today. Um, two quick announcements. The first is that you were offered cards, hopefully on the way in, uh, to write down questions. Um, there are two students who will be collecting questions and passing them up front. Could you identify yourselves? Oh, there you are. Um, so please uh, feel free to, to write down some questions. We'll get through as many as we can in the limited time that we have. Uh, the second thing that I'd like to do is uh, to announce that we'll be starting with a short video about the work of the Bipartisan Commission on Political Reform. So, AJ. In March of 2013, a group of 29 bipartisan leaders came together to examine America's deeply polarized political system. The task? To explore the causes and consequences of this partisan divide and find ways to unlock the gridlock. Together, they sought to make our electoral processes fairer, break the congressional stalemate, and promote public service. The Commission on Political Reform faced a difficult challenge. Consensus was no easy task. And when commissioners sat down to develop recommendations, it was clear there was a wide range of viewpoints among the group. I was worried that we had liberals and conservatives, Republicans and Democrats, and that we would really never be able to reach consensus on any issue. It was heated, but anytime you try to find a consensus with a diverse group, it's not easy, but we produced a good product. After 15 months, four town hall meetings, and countless debates, polls, and meetings with experts. The Commission on Political Reform released its final report with 65 recommendations, a bipartisan blueprint to strengthen our democracy. The concrete recommendations forged by Republicans and Democrats, we give people hope and the means to focus on specific and constructive ways that are empowering.
Local redistricting is a very political. Uh, it is, in many cases, very polarizing within the districts and in, within the states. And so we've got to find a way to get over that and to find something that uh, is fair and everybody understands and produces a better result. The commission recommends that states adopt redistricting commissions that have bipartisan support from the legislature and the electorate. Encouraging states to do that is one really important way that you can ensure that you're not sending the most partisan people to Congress. You know, sort of coupled with that is that we really encourage states to figure out ways to raise the number of people who are actually voting in those congressional primaries in particular. The problem we face with voter registration is that we want as many people voting as we can possibly get, but at the same time, we want to prevent vote fraud. We don't want dead people or multiple voting going on. That's the problem we face. I believe it should be as easy as possible to vote. I believe the polls should be open as long as possible. I believe it should be easy to register to vote. I believe it's the most important thing we do as citizens. To enhance voter participation, the Commission recommends holding more open primary elections and creating a single national congressional primary date in June. Having primaries all on one day helps to really coalesce the media attention and the public attention around the election that's going on instead of spreading them over several months. We have a single general election day. We need a single primary election day. To strengthen public trust, the Commission recommends a clear, transparent way to follow the money in elections. Another important and achievable action would be to require disclosure of political contributions, including those that are made to outside and independent groups, uh, so that citizens have full information on who is paying for the message that they see. Well, the filibuster is a Senate tradition that allows unlimited speech. You can speak as long as you want to. The record is over 24 hours by Strom Thurmond back in the 1960s. It's been abused in recent years. Lyndon Johnson had one filibuster in six years. Harry Reid, in that same period of time, has had over 300. That's all you need to know about filibusters and the abuse today. Well, I think that the filibuster has become a problem. I think it's being overused. But I also think that it's important that minority rights and opportunities of all senators to offer amendments be protected. To reduce gridlock from filibusters, the commission recommends limiting the filibuster, allowing more minority party amendments, and restoring the legislative committee process. The minority has to have a voice in legislation. That's what compromise and consensus is all about. And we believe that may be the biggest obstacle right now is, is getting to that consensus. And you're not gonna get to it unless you offer the minority party an opportunity to amend. Like all the young men of my generation, I did public service in the form of the draft. We didn't do it for service reasons, but it had the experience of binding the country together by giving everyone in the generation a common experience to share. We're missing that today. I'll agree that the government may not be the best organization to provide opportunities for service, but there should be ways the government can look around to make opportunities available to everyone. To engage Americans in civic life, the Commission recommends encouraging all Americans ages 18 to 28 to commit to one full year of service in their communities and to the nation through military, civilian, or volunteer service. I think that the federal government should scale up its role in places like the Peace Corps and AmeriCorps and others in order to get people the opportunities they need. But doing this will make young people better positioned to be contributing uh, citizens to this country. The Commission's recommendations have the potential to transform the nation's politics and civic life at a critical time in our nation's history. Everywhere I travel, people are fearful that the current dysfunction is going to become a permanent culture. But regardless of what the political classes and the polarizing forces would have you believe, we can bridge the partisan divide. 
That's what the Commission on Political Reform is all about. So, um, uh, Secretary Glickman and Senator Snow, I'd like uh, you to, to start by telling us a little bit about how things have changed uh, since each of you entered into federal service in Washington. Senator Snow? Well, just um, be like asking if it snows in Maine in the wintertime, right? Or in New Hampshire, for that matter. It has dramatically changed. People ask me all the time, is it really that different? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because the process isn't working, um, as was underscored by uh, the video, is the fact that you don't have a process that allows the bridge building that's necessary to pass legislation. Mm -hmm you know, and working out through the issues and having a committee process, uh, reporting the, uh, the bills to the floor and having an open amendment process, and that's true in the United States Senate. Uh, when I, I always say that when I was a freshman um, in the minority in the U.S. House of Representatives, and you can't get lower than that, right? <laughs> I was able to offer amendments. Uh, you know, I was able to, you know, debate the issues, and we had open, unfettered debate, even in the House of Representatives uh, serving in the minority. And that was true in the United States Senate up until recent years. That process virtually shut down with bills being crafted behind closed doors, not allowing the committee uh, to work through the issues uh, with the rank and file. And amendments are bridge builders. Uh, but today what's happened is that they try to prevent amendments being offered so that it protects the members from having to vote on tough issues. And I didn't get the memo. Did you, Dan? You know, that uh, you only get to vote on the easy issues. Uh, but that's what's happened. Uh, and so as a result, um, you're not getting the issues um, considered in the, in the House and Senate and not work focusing on the key issues that matter to the country. Well, I see we have two former members here, Dick Sweat and Paul Hodes, and maybe there's others that I don't recognize. So there, there's a lot of expertise. They can also talk about this as well. But sometimes I wonder, is this, are we just yearning for nostalgia here, you know, the way things used to be? I, you know, with all the criticism of Congress, uh, that great sage Mark Twain said 121 years ago, there's only one true criminal class in America, and that's the Congress. And so, I mean, in some sense, you know, we're kind of, reliving maybe my father used to say it was always better in earlier life and it, I'm not sure that was true but in this case I don't think it's totally true and in addition to the things that Olympia talked about there's two other factors here first is money the uh, so I ran for Congress in 1976 I ran against an incumbent Republican he was had served 16 years I spent one hundred thousand dollars in the primary and the general and I won that race would cost five million dollars today and Easy. plus a lot Easy. of undisclosed money and it just Easy. it's just so it just changes the dynamic of the work of Congress when you have to do nothing but raise the money and I think most members are honest they try to do their job the right way mm -hmm. but it just it's just saturated it's just it's just a constant frenetic game to raise money and the donors the donees and that's a huge profound change and just a quick anecdote so I used to go on the floor of the house and watch the debate and today, if I did that, I'd be told I would be guilty of malpractice. I need to be on the telephone raising money. So you see how that changes the culture of the place. And the second thing is media has changed so dramatically. So, you know, again, back when I ran for the House and most of the time I served, there were a limited number of media markets, uh, television, radio stations, home, your hometown stuff. The constituents, by and large, learned your work from your communications with them and to some extent the media. But today, instantaneity of information, uh, all the social media, the bombardment of information. You know, when Speaker Boehner ran for Speaker, there were thousands of messages from co Republican constituents to Republican House members, vote against Speaker Boehner. I mean, we would have never had that 30 years ago. I mean, the, I don't think the poor guy knew what hit him, and he still won, which, uh, in, and I think he's actually a, a, will be, if the Republicans have to control the House, he'll be as good a speaker as they can get. I guess that's the way I'd say it. So I'm glad he won. Uh, but, but so that's changed the process, too. And uh, so we have internal problems. As, as Olympia talked about, you've got these external problems. It just makes it so much more difficult to serve the public will. And so I'd say that's another big thing. Mm. Mm. Well, um, 
I'm, I teach constitutional law here, and right now we're, we're studying the structure of government, and it often comes as a surprise to students um, how, how um, the Constitution is structured to make it difficult to get things done. Um, and one question I have is, mm -hmm. to what extent is some of the dysfunction that's, that we are all aware of uh, constitutionally baked in? Um, you mentioned the money problem. Well, the Supreme Court has recently interpreted the First Amendment um, to um, make it very difficult to regulate money in politics. There's presently an appeal pending before the Supreme Court uh, challenging the constitutionality of a redistricting commission um, in Arizona. Um, and that's also, I know, noticed one of the recommendations of the commission. Um, is, there, is the Constitution the main culprit? Um, or is, there, is it beyond that at this point? Well, it certainly didn't help uh, when the Supreme Court you know, rendered the decision it did in Citizens United. In mm -hmm. fact, it struck down the provision that I authored with Senator Jeffords and the McCain-Feingold on issue advocacy, which we, what we did was draw a bright line on, on those ads that are aired 60 days before a general election, 30 days before a primary. And, you know, if, if, if an organization did, um, it would be considered to be an ad designed to influence the outcome of election if you identified that person by name who was serving in office and was up for re-election. Uh, in other words, they would have to act more as a political action committee than as an independent organization. So they would be restricting the amount of money they could spend uh, or raise. And unfortunately, this, it, survived, it survived the first challenge. And, um, I saw Sandra Day O'Connor after she retired from the court, and she said it won't survive the second. Um, after she, and unfortunately, it did with Citizens United. And then, of course, the court unraveled 100 years of case law and precedent uh, to what we have today, which is, you know, is regrettable. I mean, that's a, you know, it's, a, it's deeply disturbing in terms of the direction that that now is taking and shaping these campaigns. I mean, as Dan has indicated, we know the hundreds of millions. You know, the outside groups are spending. Uh, according to OpenSecrets.org, over half a billion dollars was spent in the midterm election. I mean, think about it, half a billion dollars. Uh, you know, can you imagine what's going to happen in the, in the presidential campaign, in the presidential election? It's going to be, you know, we're, gonna, we're talking in the billions, frankly. I mean, that's where this is going. Ninety percent of those ads are attack ads. I mean, they're, they're to demonize the other side. It's the politics of destruction now. It's not about enhancing a candidacy. It's destroying other candidacies. And, and so what happens, what Dan is speaking of, is that it elevates the threshold of the amount of money you have to raise, not only for the person who's running against you, but also the organizations that you will anticipate that will be weighing in on your candidacy. So that requires millions more. So yes, in that in instance, I mean, obviously the court has made a decision and weigh in. What can we do? Well, what we recommend is transparency and disclosure. Right. I mean, we are entitled to know who is contributing uh, to these organizations. So if, you know, for Citizens for Better America contributing to a super PAC, they don't have to disclose their donors. So to Citizens for Better America, why shouldn't we know who's influencing and who's behind these ads that are being financed that we that are definitely having an impact on, on these elections. So yes, that's part of it. The other part of it is the political will. And will hasn't turned up at all uh, these days in, uh, the, uh, in Washington in both the House and Senate. And unfortunately, um, people don't have the ambition and the drive you know, to work across the aisle because they don't want to take the risk of standing out and uh, incurring a primary. Mm -hmm. So as a result, you're finding more and more, you know, people serving in office who avert that risk by not working across the aisle. Uh, just to add, Olympia, two, two, one other thing on this. I don't sense any real interest in the public to change this campaign finance system. I wish you all and the whole world did have that interest, but it's not there. It's not, it's talked about topically, but I, <laughs> I just think until such time as the public gets motivated and engaged in this issue and somehow the link between the money and the policies is more specifically drawn, people will complain about the issue, which is legitimate because it's a terrible problem. And yet we've got to find a way to get the public engaged in this issue. If we don't, it's going to be really hard to change it. One other thing that you talked about. Our Constitution was set up to make our system difficult. 
we, we have a system that's really one foot on the brake and one foot on the accelerator at all time. That's what was intended. They separated the president and the executive and they put the court over on the side with sometimes superior powers. Then they distrusted the Congress, so they separated it. They didn't want the tyranny of the Congress, so they made that two equals to get a bill passed. It has to be passed exactly the same way in the House and the Senate and a conference committee and then over a deal with a presidential action and veto. So our system was designed not to work smoothly as opposed to parliamentary systems. So in order to work well, people have to have trust and they've got to work together and there's got to be civility and there's got to be procedures have to be there to give people minority rights and offer amendments. And if there's no trust, our system grinds to a halt, whereas a parliamentary system can continue to operate if one pa party is kind of running the show. Okay. So I guess what I'm saying is under the best of circumstances, the American political system was not designed to be the smoothest thing in the world. Under the worst of circumstances, it just stops. Mm. Well, you know, and I think it's... And I think it's important to underscore, it's not as if that system hadn't worked. It did, because people on both sides were willing to make sure it did. These, you stake out your ground, you put up your positions on, you know, on either side, but when they, when they don't prevail, you move on to solve the differences right. and to resolve it, and that's what's not happening. The United States Senate became more of a parliamentary system where each side voted in political blocks based on their party position. Uh, and when neither side prevailed because neither side had the votes, they just took it to the next election because that's what it's about now. It's all mm -hmm. about the elections. It's about the, the base of the political party. Everything is structured and geared and targeted towards the ideological basis of the political party and to fight it out in the election rather than fighting it out in the arena uh, in the House and the Senate. Could you talk a little bit more about this commission and, and its, uh, its set of proposals and, and, and what makes it different in, in your view and, and worth the investiture of, uh, of, of time that both of you have given it? Well, we, you know, we, as the video uh, indicated, uh, we worked on this for a better part of two years and held four town meetings across the country. They were bookended by uh, the first meeting at the Reagan Library and the final one at the Kennedy Library in addition to the Constitution Center in Ohio State University and assemble these 65 recommendations. I think the key in all of this is, is to make, the one, the Congress to function again, so institutional reforms, uh, such as, um, you know, like a five-day work week. We thought that would be pretty good, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, let's start there. Uh, you know, how, how the schedule generally works, uh, and it certainly did in the Senate, was you had a vote on at 5.30 Monday night, which was considered to be the bed check vote, and by Thursday, everybody smells jet fumes, or what Dan was talking about, even having to go out and raise money or, or go home, which is obviously important. I went home all the time, but you can't compress a legislative schedule into two and a half days and think you're going to be focusing on the complex issues facing uh, this nation. I mean, the House was in session last year 147 days, and the Senate only 141. So we talk about a five-day work week, three weeks on and one week in, the, in your district or, or your state, uh, making the committee process work, uh, restoring the amendment process, because that's important to, you know, reconciling those uh, differences. Um, we also had uh, the idea that the president uh, meet with the bipartisan leadership on, on a monthly basis. You cannot have the executive and legislative branches operating as parallel universes. I mean, they have to communicate. And uh, that's obviously not been happening. I mean, they've been trying recently, you know, days after the election, the president invited the leadership down to the White House. They looked like they were forced to eat their vegetables, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> They'll get used to each other, though, I'm sure. <laughs> but so we focus on congressional reforms, electoral reforms, and then how to encourage public uh, service and participation in public service. Mm -hmm. And uh, just a couple of things. I want to mention this primary issue. So uh, given the redistricting in Congress, most districts are rather homogeneous now. So um, uh, there are very few districts where you have a swing where they'll vote one party presidentially and one party congressionally. It doesn't happen anymore very much. There are a few districts. And so the elections are often in the primaries. And the primaries are battles for the extremes of the party because the primaries get very low voter participation. It's less than 20% in this country vote in primaries. So if you don't vote in a pri if you vote in a primary, you're going to vote to your edges. And therefore, I know very many good members of Congress who are just 
tongue-tied because of their primaries, and they have to <coughs> go to the extreme or else they're going to lose the election in their primaries, and that becomes a big problem for them. That's why we talk about nationalizing the dates of primaries and somehow encouraging much more voter participation in primaries, which are often forgotten elections in this country as opposed uh, to, the, okay. to the general election. So that, that I think, is a big part of it. The, the uh, public service thing is also very important. You're going to hear, I think, uh, the President or Dean uh, John talked about Stanley McChrystal coming, former head of our soldiers in Afghanistan. He's been pushing very hard to get national service in America. I implore you to go and listen to him. That is a profound thing. You talk to Tom Brokaw and people who served in World War II. They talk about this collaborative, collective experience in the military. And it also exists in civilian service and uh, in nonprofit service, something where you have to do something beyond people you're comfortable with for a while. And it changes your life, and you become much more community sensitive. Because part of this problem is the fact that uh, the, the people have to get engaged in their world. Uh, Robert Putnam will talk about this in the whole bowling alone situation as well. And finally, I just have to talk about the White House. So I served in the executive branch as well. And if a president doesn't engage the Congress directly, then the system doesn't work very well. And those presidents that do engage are more successful than those that don't engage. I worked for a president, President Clinton, who had his, uh, he worked the Congress, he worked everybody, so <laughs> not just the Congress. But it made a big difference in terms of his, of his skill in getting things through. Now it's tougher now than it was even when President Clinton was office. But the executive and the legislative branches have to work in sync in order to get anything done in America. And if they don't work in sync, then that's another contributing factor for gridlock. You know, it's true, uh, you know, what Dan's saying. I mean, everything now is geared towards the politics and not to solving the problems facing this country. It's all about the next election and, and sort of really <clears throat> reinforcing the power bases of the political parties and, and what they represent. But, you know, it's amazing how much has changed. It's not to suggest there was a golden era of bipartisanship, but we figured out how to make the process work and the system work, and understanding what the other side needed. I mean, you know, Chris Matthews talked about that a lot of, uh, regarding the relationship between President Reagan and Speaker Tip O'Neill, which, you know, Dan and I served at that period of time in the House of Representatives. It was true. It wasn't as if they always found common ground on issues, but they knew, you know, what the other side needed, what each other needed in order to to make it work or to fulfill their legislative goals. And that's what's not happening today. I mean, you can think about 1986, I was going back to review, you know, what kinds of bills became law during election year. You know, in 1986, we passed both immigration reform and tax reform before the election. I mean, can you imagine that today? Can you imagine? I mean, that's just as uh, unheard of. In 1996, I, I know this, in a short period of time, um, because I'm thinking about Trent up there, because he was the majority leader at that point, we passed the minimum wage, I mean, increase in the minimum wage, uh, the Landmark Welfare Reform Act, and uh, the health, you know, health insurance portability, which was the Kassebaum Kennedy uh, legislation. I mean, the Civil Rights Act was passed in, in 1964. If you're starting to look back, so it was possible. They'll have you believe now that's not possible. It was all possible. Mm. If both sides were willing to work it out and to solve the issues and to focus on the, uh, on the issues at hand. And I would just say this. I don't want you all to think nothing gets done because that's not true either. There is well, a lot. about. <laughs> but no, there, there, there is a lot. Okay, you talk to members individually. There's a lot of collaborative spirit and effort, particularly on smaller, on smaller pieces of legislation. There, there, there is bipartisan work going on. Most members of Congress are good people. They want to get things done. But the problem is on the bigger things. The, you know, whether it's immigration or transportation or infrastructure or taxation or, you know, all these big, big things. And it just, it's just a, a, a total conflict situation, total battles. I mean, the president says X and the Congress, if it's the other party, says Y. It doesn't matter what it is. And by the way, it works both sides. I don't want you to think this is just a partisan issue. It's both sides are, are guilty of this. I, my, my own view, is in a somewhat partisan sense, is I think there are more issues on the Republican side now than on the Democratic side, but I don't want you, think, you to think the Democrats are blameless either. Well, you know, one of the things that um, <clears throat> our, the Bipartisan Policy Center and the Commission on Political Reform is recommending is having a, a healthy Congress, you know, index. So have metrics in which you can evaluate members of the Congress and in Congress itself in terms of number of days and sessions, 
uh, whether or not they had, you know, committee hearings and meetings and marking up bills and having amendments on the floor so that you have specifics by which you can evaluate the progress that's being made on some of these issues to get, you know, the Senate working again, which is critically important. But just to give you a dimension of how much has changed, in my, the last Congress in which I served, the 112th, which was, you know, just before the previous one, uh, the last one, and uh, we passed 283 bills. And we were, we were compared to 1947, the do-nothing Congress, uh, which is what President Truman described that Congress. And they passed 906 bills. This last Congress became the second least productive, uh, and they, in, they adopted 296 bills mm. that became law. So it gives you an idea to the extent to which very little is being accomplished, and certainly not on the bigger items. Yeah, yeah, many of those things were naming courthouses right. and it's stuff true. like that. Too. It's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have a question here, and it, it, mm -hmm. it, you had mentioned President Reagan and, and Tip O'Neill, mm -hmm. and uh, this question is how do we get back to um, how uh, uh, Senator Kennedy uh, was famous for working with Senator Hatch it's across true. the aisle. And I'm, I'm wondering, especially with people coming from uh, ever more homogeneous districts, uh, like you say, are, aren't they incentivized precisely to go to Washington and not to work together? And is there some way to, to break that cycle and to incentivize people to work together, even though that might hurt during the primaries uh, with, the, with the base at home? Well, I always say, you know, as a Republican, having represented Maine, which was a blue state, you had to be purple, right? I mean, the fact is, and the, the point is, I was hearing many voices, yeah. not just Republican voices, I was hearing Democrat voices, I was hearing independent voices. I mean, so you had a diversity of views. And uh, for so many now, uh, today, that that is no longer the case. I mean, I think we had a jettison the red and blue state you know, approach and, and unite under the red, white, and blue, because that's what it's about. It's about the entire country. And obviously, you're going to have your differences. But if you look at the House of Representatives, there are very few remaining competitive seats. Some will say as few as seven, perhaps 21, 35, 68, doesn't matter. Very few out of the 435, you know, are truly competitive because they have been, you know, geared towards being either solidly Republican or solidly Democrat. So they're not. Uh, you know, having that diverse views, and that's what's happening. So there's no incentive to be bipartisan uh, because it runs the risk of having a primary. And now people are just always appealing to that n very narrow ideological base and not wanting to appeal to the broader population because they don't, they do not vote in primaries, uh, for example. That's why we need to have, you know, op you know, open primaries and having states adopt that. It's one of our other recommendations because. Primaries are playing a disproportionate role in our elections today in determining who serves in the House and Senate. Could you explain what an open primary is just so that Yes, you says. know, and there are variations on that. I mean, you have the, you know, the California version, which would be not to have one representative from each state. It could be the top two vote-getters, right. for example. Or you can allow independents uh, to vote in a primary. Some, you know, like in my state, you have to sign up, right. you know, with a party in order to vote, but you can do that on Election Day. Um, or you have, obviously, the clothes that you have to be a member of the Republican or Democratic uh, Party. So uh, that there are variations that it would be up to the state to adopt, you know, which approach. Mm -hmm. But the point is, is encouraging more people to vote in primaries. The Washington Post estimated in July, and it wasn't the completion of the primary process, there are 123 million people who are potential voters in, a, in primaries, and only 18 million at that point had cast their ballots in a primary. Right. So, I mean, you know, that just, I think, underscores how few people are participating. And ultimately, it's the primaries that are determining who serves. Because oftentimes, that these are not the choices that people want to vote on in the general election, so they're staying home. 36% was the voter turnout in this last election. 36%. That's a meager number. And that's disconcerting. It's a vicious circle, though. A lot of people don't vote because they don't see it's terribly relevant right. because nothing's going on, you know. And so it's like if the system doesn't look like it's producing anything, then it's very hard to get people to go out and vote, particularly younger people. They don't think, what difference does it make? I think that's wrong, but that attitude is there. I, I envy uh, Olympia coming from Maine, a state that's purple, or New Hampshire, which is a state that just is so rich in politics. You, by the way, I'm not announcing for president today, but it would be an interesting <laughs> thing to do. 
uh, run with Dick Sweat because that would be a good, you know. <laughs> Uh, but I come from a state that's so red it bleeds all the time. We are the longest state that hasn't elected a Democratic United States Senator. 1932 was the last Democratic Senator elected in my state. And, and so, and it's a state that's, you know, the last time, it did go for Lyndon Johnson in 1964, but, but uh, you know, so it's, uh, but it, it's tough. But one of the problems is, in, but the people of Kansas are no real different than the people here. Most people are kind of in the center, right, middle, or left of center, and and 80 percent of the people there. The problem is it's the 20 percent on the edges that are driving the, the philosophical discussion. So, you know, uh, uh, Pogo said we have met the enemy, and he is us. In some cases, it's up to the people to engage their system. I mean, we can blame the political system all we want, but somehow, you know, folks have to get engaged, and it's got to be viewed as important right. to them to get engaged. And that goes back to the whole issue of service and getting engaged in your your society. One other thing I want to raise, and that's the question of leadership. So you listen to Lyndon Johnson's tapes when Johnson's talking to Richard Russell about the civil rights thing. And Russell says, Lyndon, if you go for the 64 or 65 Act, the Voting Rights Act, you're going to lose the South forever. And Johnson says, if that's the way it is, that's the way it is. And, you know, and, and I thought to myself, uh, what a profound statement of leadership. One of the things we have to do is both the president and congressional leaders have to act like leaders because it's not natural for individual members of Congress to necessarily do things that are not in their home best interests. And, and, and you know, people don't deliberately do that anyway. And we have to encourage leadership. And those are skills that we learn in the business world, in the institutional world, in the college world. And they're not necessarily the skills that are viewed as positive in the political world. And that's an in intangible subject, but it's one that's really important to the functioning of our democracy. Number of questions here, unsurprisingly, about uh, money and politics and, mm, and limiting the effect of, of corporate expenditures. Uh, one question is, why not have publicly sponsored political campaigns? Um, uh, it's an idea that strikes many as, uh, as sensible and one that might uh, help to level the playing field a little bit. Yeah, I haven't gotten there yet on that. <laughs> you know, I'd like to think that uh, the current system could work with some modifications and, uh, you know, and it can, you know, be an expensive proposition. It's a question of choices, I guess. But, you know, it may come to that at some point, frankly, given where the direction we're headed. I mean, the, the enormity of the burden of, of raising and spending this kind of money in these campaigns and, and the direction it's taking is uh, deeply uh, troubling, uh, frankly. And it's only getting worse. When I first came to the Senate, let alone forget the House, just in the Senate, you know, you had conversations about raising money. You understood that that was, you know, you know that you had to be, you know, you know, attentive to it, but not to the degree that it is today. And one of the things we're at least proposing is banning leadership PACs. I think I was one of three or five senators in the United States Senate did not have a leadership pact. I just refused. Tell them what a leadership pact well, does. Well, I don't know what they do. I mean, that's <laughs> yeah. what I couldn't figure out. I mean, that was it. But you had to have one because, really, basically what it is is in addition to your own campaign political action committee, uh, you had to establish a leadership pact. To, basically, it's another avenue for which you can contribute uh, to, you know, your colleagues running for re-election and for other candidates running for re-election. Uh, so it's one more dimension. And oftentimes, too, if you're chairing a committee, they'll say, well, you have to raise X, Y, and Z. I said, well, you know, I wasn't going to be into the perpetual fundraising business. I didn't mind doing it when I had to do it. But I just was, you know, I refused to do a leadership pact. But now, I think everybody has one in the, in the United States Senate, and virtually the same is true in the House of Representatives. So we're proposing just having the top three members of leadership, you know, on both sides in each chamber. Uh, having leadership pass. If you're in leadership or running for leadership, that's one thing. If you're not, you shouldn't have it. And that will take one avenue away from more money in the system, but also giving back more time to elected officials to do their jobs. Do you know how much time that fundraising takes on a weekly, daily basis now, given the sums of money members of Congress have to raise? It's almost perpetual. And the whole schedule's geared around that. That's why they have short work weeks, because they get to go and raise major sums of money, and they analyze it on a weekly basis. You can imagine the Senate. I mean, some of these raises went to 100 million. Some of them are talking about California being, you know, reaching a billion. You know, I mean, that's what we're talking about for sums of money now. So 
it is disturbing, you know, from that standpoint. So we think the transparency is important of these 501c4s because that will dampen the impact of a lot of donors about thinking, you know, whether or not they will contribute to these outside groups that, you know, are, you know, really weighing heavily into these elections now. Right. Quite, quite frankly, the commission did not, Olympia and I kind of wanted to push the right. commission further in the campaign money system. Uh, it, it just, it's, this has great partisan divide and, and uh, there's not a lot of political consensus on these issues. So while I might support some sort of public financing of campaigns, it, it will not get a majority and I see no hope for that in the, in the future. So what we have to do then is to look for other options. One option which we didn't talk about in the commission is how to encourage small donors, contributions of $200 or less, get more people giving money it's actually I ironic, but you know, it's, as opposed to limiting the dollars, it's getting more money from smaller donors may be, may be a possible way of giving more balance in our political system. Another way, I notice there's a congressman that's offering a bill and will prohibit fundraising when the Congress is in session. So you can, now that may move all the money raising to weekends or uh, to other time periods, but it is kind of unseemly yeah. that they vote on a bill and then they have a fundraiser that night and then, you know, and, and so there may be ways to tweak this system to make it a little better. Yeah, that's, that's true. We heavily debated that, that particular uh, recommendation. We did propose a national commission, you know, um, so that would include, you know, individuals from both sides of the political aisle, but, you know, academics, experts, citizens, nonprofits, uh, to serve on a national commission, if you could get both sides to be vested in the whole notion of reforming the system, that's the key here. <coughs> At some point, we hope, you know, that it is going to wear down both sides. And this is one where I, I really criticize the president of this one. So he ran as the candidate of reform, and he's operated as president on the campaign money side as the candidate of anti-reform. And, you know, I mean, it's like, yeah, so, so the leadership on this issue, which is extremely difficult, really has to come from the president politically. And I'm not saying he could have gotten anything done himself unilaterally, but he's kind of left this debate other than rhetorically. One person asks, is, the, is uh, what, what do you think the likelihood is of getting at least some of the commission's recommendations enacted? And, and more generally, what are, what are the next steps uh, that you anticipate taking? Well, we were uh, encouraged by the fact that uh, the new majority leader, Mitch McConnell, uh, you know, announced that there will be five-day work weeks, although I understand he gets a lot of pushback on that already from, you know, his own members, you can imagine. Uh, and talking about getting the Senate to, uh, to working again, um, reinvigorating the, and re-empowering the congressional committees for the chairman to bring up legislation um, to get it marked up in the committees and also to restore the amendment process which uh, you know so that is encouraging right. uh, frankly um, we'll see how it works um, that's what's going to be very important um, as to whether or not uh, the public weighs in that's why we're going to have this you know healthy congress you know index that you can communicate to your elected officials about you know whether or not you're satisfied with the progress and the way in which they're operating because I'll tell you you know the process dictates the quality of the product and the policies you know if you don't have a process then you're not going to get it I mean it's just what it is um, even take for example the Affordable Care Act um, I was on the you know, served on the Finance Committee and we actually had a very open and transparent process it was the longest markup in in 22 years. And I voted for it based in, from the Finance Committee based on the fact that it was an open process. It had a lot of problems with the package still. But it was predicated, my future is supposed to be predicating what happened on the floor. But that's what, unfortunately, is where the process broke down. It went behind closed doors and it was merged with another bill and became 2,700 pages. Uh, they should have had that bill sitting out there for months. I mean, we weren't doing anything else anyways, believe me. It wasn't as if it was tying up the legislative calendar. It, we weren't. And so th that's the way the process should work. Any major initiative should get both sides to weigh in. And believe me, eventually even senators get worn down. You know, we allow them to be able to express themselves, you know, and offer amendments and, you know, position themselves or demonstrate to their constituents what they were able to change or what they weren't, but, you know, it became a better package. And that is the process that's not, you know, happening. Yeah. And, uh, we're also going around the states to encourage uh, some political reform changes and 
especially the redistricting commissions. And I think there is some hope that several more states beyond Iowa and right. California, Arizona, and other states will do that. And I think that's a positive thing. We're also working in non-government groups. So, you know, it may be McChrystal, it may be the Gates Foundation, it may be others on this whole issue of civic responsibility and, and also, uh, uh, you know, uh, reform in the system of voluntary activities. So it's, this, this package is not just government related, although it's heavily focused on the way Congress acts, but it's also focused on trying to motivate the American people as well. Yeah, it's not underestimating your voice or your vote for that matter, frankly. It's to engage the public because otherwise you have the small fractious minority that's really, you know, influencing the process and, and the outcomes. And so it is important for citizens to get involved and to communicate using social media. We're not in the rotary dial era anymore. Uh, it's right at our fingertips and to be able to communicate with your elected officials, um, about, you know, with your views and your positions. And so we're trying to engage the citizens through Citizens for Political Reform. So we encourage you to go to our website, bipartisanpolicy.org, because not only does it have our report, but also you know, ways in which you can uh, adopt, you know, these initiatives. I mean, through the, the old-fashioned grassroots way uh, for establishing, an you know, a redistricting commission that has support on both sides, frankly. I mean, in Ohio, the Bipartisan Policy Center is working, you know, in the state of Ohio, and, and, there's, and there's a citizen's initiative to put uh, redistricting on the ballot for state legislative races. But, you know, you can do it. And it is critically important that states begin to think that way because of the 2020 reapportionment. And frankly, we've got to have more competitive seats. You don't have to change every state in the country. You just change enough to change the political equilibrium in the House of Representatives. And the same is true for open primaries. You can go through the legislature or you can get it on, on the ballot if you, or, you, know, you have citizens' initiatives. And I want to thank uh, Senator Snow. Hopefully, you'll join me again, and John Grabe and Secretary Glickman for a very interesting. I wish there were a hundred of you in the Congress of the United States. Would you please join me in thanking? Thank I wanted to. I wanted to end on a light note. I promise I'll be brief. Uh, Senator Bob Kerry was sitting in the well of this courtroom. In, in this uh, classroom in April of 2013. They were talking about debt and deficit. And he was saying, in response to something Senator McCain had said, that he didn't want to blame the American people, but it was getting harder for congressmen to cast those votes because there's a great divide in the country and a lot of money. And he said, I want to tell you a story about uh, Alan Simpson that Simpson had told him. And so Simpson had cast a really tough vote. Uh, in, in the Senate, and he went home for the weekend. He thought it was the right vote, but he knew it wouldn't make everyone happy. And he was from Wyoming. And so he said he was home on Saturday at a local store, and a fellow came up to him and said, Senator, I am furious about your vote on Thursday. I, I supported you in every election. I'm not going to support you anymore. I wouldn't support you, Senator, if you were Jesus Christ. And Alan Simpson looked at him and said, sir, if I were Jesus Christ, I wouldn't be representing Wyoming. <laughs> anyway, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. <laughs>